Today, we are thrilled to have with us Tim Ford from the Alberta College of Paramedics, um, and he is going to explain their roles and the valuable work that they do in rural Alberta. So, Tim, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks a lot, Alicia. Um, I, thanks for having me here today. I just will let you know that I'm being joined also by uh, Leslie Scudder. She works with our comms department. She's here to make sure that uh, she keeps me on track and and uh, that <laughs> that we keep this entertaining. And she also did a lot of help with my presentation. So as Alicia mentioned, my name is Tim Ford. I'm an advanced care paramedic. I uh, have been since uh, 1999. I've worked in various um, roles uh, as a paramedic throughout the province, uh, both uh, rural, mostly in central eastern Alberta, um, as well as uh, urban in Edmonton and Calgary. Um, about five years ago, I took on the role of registrar at the Alberta College of Paramedics. And um, today, I'm just going to walk you through a little bit about um, what what role paramedics can play in healthcare, what our role as a college is, uh, some of the challenges we might be facing, and maybe some um, uh, how uh, paramedics can assist in uh, rural healthcare communities and what, what can be done to maybe attract and retain um, these healthcare professionals in those communities. So I have a little quick uh, seven screen PowerPoint to share with you here. The first thing I wanted to talk about, what is a paramedic? What can we do? What's our scope of practice? You know, most of us uh, understand when they see an ambulance that there's likely paramedics on the ambulance, but you may or may not know that we regulate um, currently three and actually soon to be four different designations of paramedics. Um, we have, uh, as you can see on the screen, emergency medical responders. Uh, those are called EMRs. And this is a, generally the entry point that people get into our profession. The training is about 240 hours of education. It's it's things like basic first aid, CPR, uh, some first frontline pain management, um, splinting, uh, dealing with some trauma. So it's um, and there's a educate or sorry a driving component uh, that is a part of this as well as uh, driving is uh, you know for the most part a, a pretty important part of our our work. These EMRs typically work with an, a higher trained uh, practitioner. Often it's referred to when they work with a primary care paramedic, it's a basic life support ambulance, but they also may work with other EMRs when they're doing uh, interfacility transfers or transfers from uh, rural to urban or return trips from uh, the hospitals in the big cities to uh, rural communities. And very often EMRs work in our industrial settings. So on uh, work camps or uh, pipeline crews, uh, drilling, cr drilling rigs, there are, is a requirement uh, by OHS to have a registered healthcare professional on site, and generally EMRs are uh, utilized in this capacity. It's kind of the entry level point of getting into our profession, and often um, EMRs, once they get a sort of a taste of this and they believe that it's something they want to pursue, they'll move on to become uh, take training to become a primary care paramedic, and that's what we refer to as a PCP. Uh, the training programs are about six to 12 months in length. Um, you get some, uh, as it says, advanced first aid, introductory pharmacology, more understanding of, of uh, anatomy and physiology, how disease processes work on the body, um, an introduction to cardiac uh, care. And this uh, primary care paramedic, uh, these, these practitioners make up the bulk of our membership. Um, and so very often you'll find primary care paramedics working uh, together on ambulances in rural communities. Occasionally they'll have advanced care paramedics depending on the community. Um, and as I mentioned, this is referred to as basic life support. The next designation that we regulate is the advanced care paramedic or ACPs. And this is a currently a two year diploma certification and they really get into the, the, um, the nuts and bolts of, of what our profession can do. It's uh, advanced airways, um, a, a wide range of pharmacology, um, advanced cardiac life support, which is uh, a, a training course to provide uh, care for, for people when their heart stops. Um, there's a number of surgical procedures that are taught um, and often uh, the, the trauma room on wheels is, is how we refer to our, our ACP uh, practitioners or the ALS um, coverage. Most of the urban centers, and I would say any a town or city with more than uh, about 10,000 people in it would will likely have ALS coverage or advanced care life, 
advanced care paramedics working on the ambulance. But this isn't always the case in rural because it tends to be the uh, the, the urban environment or the cities are, are tend to pull um, practitioners into these during their training and and, and often uh, they don't have the opportunity to get back out into rural or they're they're already given or offered op- um, employment opportunities in the cities. Um, and so I'll talk a bit more about that in a bit. Um, and then we do have a designation that we're we're authorized to regulate, but we haven't enacted it uh, yet because for a number of reasons, but uh, critical care paramedic is, you may have heard this designation in other, five other provinces have critical care paramedics. Um, we uh, will have this soon. It's a, an initiative of the college that we have, that we are looking to uh, implement. Um, and often uh, the flight environment is where you would find your critical care paramedics. Although there are um, community care paramedics in the, in some of the, the bigger centers that are providing the same type of care as a critical care paramedic might do in the flight environment. So we're we're looking at um, amending our regulations to allow us to recognize this designation, and that'll happen. Boy, I, I hope in the next um, eighteen to twenty-four months. So uh, yeah, we're excited about that. Uh, just a little breakdown of what we um, our numbers. We currently regulate about nine thousand practitioners. Uh, the breakdown is, as you see it on the screen, about half of them or just under half are PCPs, uh, ACPs about 3,000 and about 1,300 EMRs. Um, we also have uh, the ability to, to put these graduates of these new programs into practice as soon as they're completed their program. There is a national entry to practice exam that is offered five times a year, but um, you know we want to get these practitioners out and working. Uh, so we have a general register and a provisional register. And the provisional register is just a way we can get these people out working under supervision of a, of a trained practitioner until they complete their entry to practice exam. So that's a little bit of the number breakdown. I won't bore you too much with the, the, any more details about that. And I'll uh, move on into a little bit about what we do as a regulatory body. Um, Often the you know the term college, uh, you, most of us and myself included, prior to getting into this, the, the college you think about an educational institution, and we're actually um, a regulatory body. There's 29 regulatory bodies or regulated health professions in Alberta. So you've got doctors, nurses, dentists, chiropractors, midwives, all have their own college. Uh, in 2016, uh, our profession was. Uh, uh, became part of the Health Professions Act. And, and as such, we formed a formal college to regulate uh, these practitioners. So the intent of regulatory bodies is to protect the public. Um, so if public have concern about um, the care that they've received from a practitioner, um, or the government wants to ensure that a certain um, level of training is required to be completed. The regulatory body um, is tasked with with uh, taking care of this. Um, there, there really are four primary roles uh, that we do. We set education standards. Um, so we have a number of educational institutions across Alberta that um, train um, EMRs, PCPs, and ACPs. So we set the educational standards for these institutions and do um, uh, reviews of the programs to ensure that they meet meet our requirements. Uh, we register every practitioner. So we know um, uh, we have all the demographics. We have the contact information. A paramedic or an, ACE, uh, or an EMR in, in Alberta has to be registered with us to, to perform uh, care. And so we manage the registration and renewal requirements. Um, we also ensure that they uh, maintain their competency. So we have a continuing competence or a continuing education program. Um, that each year our practitioners have to um, meet certain educational or training requirements. And then lastly, um, we have a conduct department. And this is, uh, we have a complaints director and a team of investigators who um, field complaints from the public, other healthcare professionals, and members of our own profession when uh, the care isn't uh, up to the standards that we set out. And uh, one of the things that we do is we do have standards of practice and code of ethics that we uh, require our members to adhere to. Um, I won't go into all the different ones, but there are, um, if there's violations of these standards of practice or code of ethics, our conduct team will, will uh, conduct an interview, search for a resolution 
Um, and, and if that's not uh, possible to get a resolution, which would be often training or additional training or upgrading, uh, it would go to a tribunal uh, for, a dis, uh, for a decision. And often that would mean um, you know, a sanctions against a, a license. And, and in the very rarest cases, uh, it would mean uh, the cancellation of a, of a, a practitioner's permit. Uh, and I say very rare is that, that we, we, as a college, we strive to, with our members to try and um, work towards improving their practice. Um, you know, there are, there are, like I say, very few situations that arise where um, the behavior is, is so egregious that we would instantly cancel a license, but that does happen from time to time. And, and when it does, often you read about it in the papers. So that is sort of the four main areas of our role as a regulatory body. And this is the same for uh, nurses, doctors, dentists. Each of them has a college that are responsible for these same four elements. Just wanted to talk a little bit about the provincial EMS model. Most of our practitioners work in some form of delivering um, emergency medical care. And that's generally on an ambulance or a plane. Uh, we do have a number of, of uh, registered members working in roles like mine that are more administrative and they're not quite hands on the f- or boots on the ground. But uh, for those that are, th- if you're providing care uh, to the public in Alberta, you're part of uh, the provincial EMS system. And that is currently written, run by AHS EMS. Um, AHS, Alberta Health Services, Emergency Medical Services, but AHS EMS stands for. And AHS EMS um, is the majority employer um, across the province for uh, our practitioners. And AHS EMS often um, uh, will contract out their services in some areas. So um, there are uh, some areas of the, of the province, um, mostly northern and more remote uh, that uh, they contract their services to another private ambulance service. So you may have heard of Medivy or Associated Ambulances. Those are two of the bigger private companies, uh, but they still uh, follow uh, the guidelines and and uh, uh, are contracted to provide the services to and for and on behalf of AHS EMS. There are also seven regions in the province where um, the fire departments are providing the EMS service. Um, that's uh, Red Deer, uh, Strathcona, uh, Leduc, sorry, uh, sorry, Leduc, Red Deer, Strathcona, uh, Lethbridge, Fort McMurray, uh, St. Albert, and Kenmore. And um, these uh, services had EMS, um, uh, were providing EMS care prior to um, the big amalgamation in 2009 when um, we t- moved into one provincial EMS or ambulance system. Prior to 2009, there was um, a number of private or municipally run ambulance services. I worked for a few myself, Provost EMS, uh, Lakeland EMS, uh, it, but there were so many of these services at that end. There was different models at the, at the time the Minister of Health had decided to uh, amalgamate all of them into uh, one provincial model. And so this was intended to be borderless and ensure that ALS uh, ambulances from the cities or ALS um, practitioners would be able to easily transfer out to uh, rural Alberta and deliver ALS care anywhere in the province. But it, I mean, if you follow the news at all lately, you'll know that um, ambulance response times aren't quite um, what they need to be. Uh, um, and the AHS EMS uh, model is, is really struggled, to, I would just say, to, to maintain some of the response times over the past, particularly over the past three or four years. Um, and then on the last little box there, just uh, you may have heard there's recent announcements about restructuring AHS, and um, we haven't quite uh, determined exactly where this provincial model um, uh, will, how it will evolve, if it will evolve, or if it will remain the existing model. So uh, we work closely with our partner, partners in governance, government. In fact, we meet with the Minister of Health on a fairly regular basis to try and understand what what, if any, changes to the landscape uh, may happen and how it will affect our members and ultimately how it will affect the public. Um, So that's a little bit about the existing uh, provincial model for ambulances. Um, I thought I would just lean on a little bit of my personal experience here and talk about how EMS is different in perhaps rural 
than urban. You know, I, I worked uh, mostly in, like I said, East Central Alberta, so Wainwright Provost, um, that area um, when I first started uh, up in Cold Lake for a while. And then I moved to Edmonton and ultimately Calgary, where I, I worked the majority of my career. And uh, there are there are some significant differences between uh, practicing in rural and practicing in urban. I just thought I would just touch on this for a bit. We we respond in in Calgary uh, to far more calls per day uh, than I would have ever in rural. However, these calls tend to be: you go to someone's house, you, you figure out what the issue is, you get them in the ambulance, go to the hospital. The, sometimes our contact time with a patient can be 10 to 15 minutes. And as you've heard in the, in the hospitals, then we often end up waiting in the hospitals with these patients until the doctors and nurses can accept them into the ERs. While you can do a lot more calls in, an, in the urban environment, they tend to be shorter touch points with, with the patients. Where with rural, you have, um, you know, quite often you will go to um, a longer response time. So when you're transporting back to the hospitals, you may find that you get to spend 45 minutes to an hour with the patient in the back of the ambulance, just uh, treating their, uh, you know, um, their acute issues. We find that the interventions that have to be performed rurally tend to be uh, higher. It does not as frequent, but you often get into, as you go down the, the, the steps of, of care that you're going to provide, you often get to further down the, the list, further down the algorithm, we call it. And, and, you're providing um, some some higher acuity interventions uh, in the urban setting, or sorry, in the rural setting than you would in urban, just because your response times are so short. The trauma calls uh, rural uh, tend to be far more significant, um, just because highway speeds are are what they are rurally, and and fender benders in the city, while you still can get injuries, don't tend to be quite as severe. The other aspect of of rural versus urban is is the overtime that we all uh, have to sort of take on. So if you get a call near the end of your shift in Edmonton, in Edmonton or Calgary, um, it, it can mean 30 to 45 minutes of overtime. Uh, but we're in the um, rural setting, it, it can be uh, quite significant, particularly if you have to you know, get the patient to one of these smaller hospitals and they have to be then transported up to uh, a more acute uh, care facility in, in one of the bigger centers. So you can get two, three, uh, you know, four hours of overtime. And, and this is, this is one of the factors that um, comes into play when we, when we look at where practitioners choose to, to practice. Uh, but one of the biggest benefits I found working in rural settings was that the, uh, when you're working with the, with these smaller hospitals, you tend to be part of the team with the doctors, and nurses, you get to know them, you get to uh, spend more time with the patient in the trauma rooms or in the ERs, and uh, you get to carry on your provision of care. And uh, a lot of times we find that the practitioners who, who work in these rural settings really are quite skilled because they are constantly working with other health professionals and, and really are part of a team. And, uh, in my experiences with with both Edmonton and Calgary, you, you, when you get to the hospital, the ER, it's almost like there's a, a handover and 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 that's it. Your care stops right there. It's not quite the same like that in rural, and and that is one of the I think a lot of people in my profession feel that that's a benefit. So I just wanted to throw a few little thoughts out there about the difference between urban and rural, and um, and lastly, I'll just talk about a little bit of the challenges that perhaps our profession is facing perhaps uh, patients are facing when trying to access EMS services. And that is the overall staffing is pr really one of the primary concerns right now. Um, the uh, last three years have been tough on every health professional, not just our profession. Um, but uh, one of the figures I got, and this is probably about from 10, not quite a year ago, about 10 months ago, was about 30% of AHS EMS uh, frontline workers were on some form of leave, whether it was mental health injury, fatigue, uh, a physical injury, um, or uh, stress, which really has an impact on the amount of ambulances that AHS EMS can put on the road. Less ambulances means uh, longer response times, which means less optimal care for, for patients who are in need. Along with staffing, and it kind of ties into staffing, is the retention issue. Um, the number, I've, I put the number here, the, the attrition number, this number of 500 to 600 members per year leaving the profession, it sounds a little staggering when you just look at it like that, but that really is a trend that's been happening for uh, the last two decades. We, uh, we have members you know, re retiring, getting to retirement age. Um, so the five to 600 leaving per year 
it's probably going to remain st- that constant. Um, so it's important that our education, our our educators keep graduating uh, new students into the workforce. And when we had the the uh, pandemic, a lot of schools uh, stopped or cut back their program or class sizes. So we did see a bit of a dip in the 2021, 2022 numbers, but we are back climbing um, into the uh, up again. So we, I think at the lowest, we were at 8,400 and now this year's numbers were 8,800 practitioners, 8,850. So we, we did see a dip, but um, we are putting members into the system uh, at least at a rate of how many are leaving. But to continue to do that um, is, uh, and I just want to talk about this, and I think this is really where we could have some interesting discussions on on um, uh, the work that your your organization does is is preceptorships. So, uh, just touching on the training that happens, um, not only is uh, our training for PCPs and ACPs uh, classroom based, and and you do labs and just like a normal training would be, there's a a practicum component where they actually go out on an ambulance or go into a um, an operating room or an emergency department or a, a, to a obstetrical ward and um, and practice their skills prior to graduating the program. And to do this, particularly on the ambulance side of it or the ambulance practicum, we need preceptors, and that is people like me paramedics who have been around for a while and and are willing to take students take these students out and um, you know they work under our supervision with the amount of uh, stress over the last couple of years um, the availability of preceptorships has uh, has shrunk so while there is funding to get more students into educational programs the bottleneck happens when these students try to get preceptorships or practicums and so we're working hard to try and enhance the quality and quantity of preceptorships but a lot of times it's been focused on the rural sorry the urban or the higher populated areas like the the red deers the lethbridges the medicine hats obviously edmonton and calgary i believe there's there's more capacity to the system Um, but getting students out from these training centers, which are typically located in the bigger um, urban environments and getting them out to rural communities to do their practicums would be an opportunity that might exist for a couple of reasons, an opportunity on a couple points. You know, you get uh, students out into the community to um, one, alleviate the pressure so we can have increased class sizes, but it also is a way for um, these students to see what their profession or their career could look like by working in a smaller community versus what they're exposed to in in uh, the bigger cities. And um, I think if we could get students out to these rural settings, um, and and one of the barriers often is, well, it's an eight-week practicum. Do I have to rent a place for eight, eight weeks or two months? How am I going to pull that off? Uh, I don't know anyone in that community. Um, you know, there are some barriers and and some some hesitations on the behalf of the students to try these uh, settings out, and in you know, in discussing this with uh, some of the members of of this group and and the rural health professionals action plan team, we thought this might be an opportunity here to just present this as one of the uh, challenges we might face, and in a way, maybe we could look at uh, uh, working together, make just uh, increasing awareness to to tackle some of the issues. So, I think that is yeah, the end of my little presentation here. So, at this point, I thought maybe we could. Uh, and see if anyone has any questions, any thoughts, any, um, you know, happy to field questions on any of that. Yeah, thanks. Hi, Tim. Joanne Kazakoff here. Um, I'm curious about your, the retention numbers that you were posting there between the four and 500. Is that, um, do you track that data based on registry registration or do you collect it in a survey? And then part B of that uh, question is, um, how much um, are you seeing where people are registered holding um, ACP numbers, but not actually working in EMS, but in some other sort of some other role in, in, in healthcare? Thanks. You bet. That's a, that's a great question, John. Um, so the way we track the attrition is actually through our registration platform. So we we know that if a practitioner doesn't renew their permit with us, that then they um, uh, that is how we that's how we track it. If they, if they don't renew, uh, we can tr- consider them attrition. We also do know when they move from province to province. So often we have 
uh, members moving to BC or to the East uh, and just transferring their permits over. So we have a way of tracking that as well. Um, those numbers tend to be more in, uh, I don't have the exact number figure in front of me, less than 100, uh, probably between 50 and 75 per year that move from province to province. Um, but I think the majority uh, do just, you know, it, they're getting to the point where this isn't the career that they choose anymore or they get to retirement age. Um, and I, so we do it through the, we don't do it through a survey. We do it strictly at looking at the numbers. And then we also do track practice settings. So we do know, um, uh, we ask, uh, and it's a mandatory uh, field that has to be filled out, what your practice setting is. So if it's ground ambulance or air ambulance um, or working with a integrated fire EMS service, uh, those numbers uh, are, I would, um, again, don't have exact numbers, but if you don't mind ballpark numbers, uh, about 6,200 practitioners uh, would work in some form of the public direct, direct delivery of care. Uh, whether it's with AHS EMS, whether it's with MetaV Associated or one of the private companies, or whether it's with Integrated Fire. And then you would have the other um, 3,000, or sorry, 2,000 and uh, 2,600, 2,500 practitioners who would work in some form of uh, administrative role. So there are people that do training. Um, they're, they're, at some of the educational institutions, there's about a, a hundred uh, that are that are teachers or instructors. Uh, there are people who do learning and development for um, Alberta Health EMS. There's AHS EMS. There's, uh, a, like I say, a training department, management roles. So um, so we do track pretty much every practice setting um, and uh, every employment setting. So we have some pretty good data. We can pull some specifics. Um, and we did about two years ago switch registration platforms, which have allowed us to really start capturing the data more accurately, to, for lack of a better word, so that we know where our practitioners are working and and when they're leaving and if they're going to other provinces. So we do have a pretty good handle on it. And if ever there was data that you were looking for or anyone was looking for, um, you know, as the regulatory body, we we are able to provide uh, that information to. Um, as long as it's non-identifying information, we are able to provide that uh, to any interested parties. Hey, Tim, I'll also just jump in here because I do have a couple numbers in front of me. Oh, so thanks, for thanks. our last annual report, which um, our membership year runs from October 1st to September 30th, um, we had 148 labor mobility applications um, and we had uh, 638 total applications received. So that includes labor mobility um, international Alberta graduates, stuff like that, and also um, registration changes. So moving from EMR to PCP, PCP to ACP. Um, I don't have the um, practice setting information in front of me, but we can also pull that after. Yeah, thanks, Leslie. Mm -hmm. See, that's why I needed you here. We needed to have keep me on track and make sure my information's accurate. Yeah, thanks, Lindsay, and and um, I appreciate appreciate that. And so maybe just start as a disclaimer. Maybe I should start should have started with that. Is um, I'm an operations director for sort sort of in a number of rural hospitals in in northern Alberta, um, and um, I I employ paramedics in my emergency departments, um, and some of my atoscope managers are paramedics, and and I myself I'm I'm actually an advanced care paramedic, but I you know I work in the clinical operation side. So it, it's a curious thing to me. I, we're probably the one percenters that are still within the AHS family, but not within the AHS EMS. So when we think of, you know, those numbers of people moving out of profession, yeah, someone like me is not in an ambulance anymore, but but still contributing to sort of that that larger healthcare continuum. And so um, I, I was curious about the 500 numbers and how that looked and, and in the practice setting. And yes, like your new platform, much easier to register. It's lovely. So well done. Well, thanks for that, Joanne. And, and uh, thanks for letting me know. I'll, I'll, um, uh, I'll pass that along to our team. We've, we have really have been trying to make that uh, new platform easier for practitioners to use. And, um, and, and it sure helps us on the back end for gathering data. So uh, thanks, Tim. I appreciate. And Leslie, 
uh, the information there. Um, we do have a question that popped up here. So what type of supports do you feel are needed in rural Alberta that would help to increase the number of preceptor spots available? When, when, when the students are in the schools and they're, and they're getting offered placement sites, often they'll snap. I mean, I would, if I was living in Calgary and I was taking a training program in Calgary, it would be great if I could just do my practicum in Calgary. And um, however, the the amount of ambulances available for those uh, amount of students really um, might not allow for that. So it is really when I when I get told, well, Tim, you have to maybe go to Brooks or um, or 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 Vulcan and do a, a practicum out there. And uh, in my mind, that means okay, well, I have to. Uh, find accommod exactly Sean just put it in there accommodations um, I, I have to so is that a hotel is that renting an apartment for a short period of time and the rotations generally are four on four off type of rotation so you know you could do it by renting a hotel room but there's an expense and you're already paying uh, a relatively large amount for your education so it's it's and you're not working as a student and you don't get paid for these practicums so there the challenge really is accommodations um for the most part, I think there's a willingness for, and I can't, I guess I can't really say with certainty on this, but I think there would be a willingness for on the behalf of the practitioners who are working in these rural communities to have students. Um, I think there's probably a willingness for the, the, you know, the, the healthcare community to bring students in. I think the, the challenge really is the logistics is getting them uh, accommodations and, and such that is uh, that would be the challenge. Thank you for that. Sure. Um, does anyone else have any questions that they would like to ask? I don't see any hands raised. Uh, Sean had an, another comment um, uh, in there, which is uh, which kind of ties a little bit into the uh, the overall system and the struggles that the system is facing. And the challenges maybe sometimes with the and Sean, feel free to expand on this. But I'm 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 guessing by the comment you made that it's it's difficult for um, to take on a student when some of the rural communities are even having uh, struggles getting full-time um, staffing out there. So uh, often you'd have one maybe full-timer that is working with uh, someone who on call or getting transferred in and you're not just, uh, you know, doing a student training, you're orientating uh, your partner as well. So that is uh, the, the, the overall staffing challenge, I think uh, trickles into a lot of different areas. And, and certainly, uh, as Sean pointed out, the precepting is, is one as well, having a regular partner. All right. Or is there anything, Tim, that you had wanted to kind of expand upon? Or, uh, I mean, you gave so much information, so it's really appreciated. Yeah, I think, um, I, I mean, my, my intent here was to just give a little, um, make sure everyone understood what, what it is that we do, our role, what our practitioners do and our members do, um, and then see about, uh, see if there are opportunities to you know, I, I shared one of the, the biggest challenges right now. There was a num there was a bunch of funding that the, the the government announced for targeted enhanced enrollments. It was called TEE funding to increase seats for specific uh, professions, and paramedics was one of them that was identified. So our schools got some funding for to increase seat size, um, but uh, the, the the bottleneck remains with preceptorship and practicums. And I really. Um, I thought this would be a great form. I just would, I would just put an, uh, an exclamation mark on that point that I'm trying to make is if there is a way to, to draw people into your community. And I know that the work that I, I've just recently learned of the work that the uh, rural health professional action plan group does. Um, if, if we can continue to, to be linked up and, and communicate, we can probably maybe see if we can um, expand preceptorships rurally and and uh, I think that that could have a, a effect on a good a positive effect on both the community and our, and our educational system. I don't know Tim can you see that uh, question? I can that, that's a great question uh, that Duncan posed and um, one thing that we're really looking at and and this is kind of getting a bit into the weeds but I think there's some knowledgeable people on here so maybe I'll just dip into the weeds a little bit Alicia if you don't mind. Um, our educational programs are built currently on a, a competency profile that was developed nationally in 2011. And that competency profile has become a bit dated, um, especially in the area of primary care paramedics. Um, there's, they're being asked to do more and more and more, but the programs are um, you know, you know, six to eight months in length. And uh, to the point about how do we ensure that they're adequately trained um, in, in such a short program, it's, it's difficult. And in fact, um, 
as not just Alberta, but nationally, all the regulators have been looking at this and saying, we need to revamp this 2011 competency profile. There's more being done than what this competency profile alludes to. And so uh, a fair bit of work has been done over the last two years. And in, and in on November 6th of this year, actually, the Canadian Organization of Paramedic Regulators, uh, which is comprised of people like me, my, my colleagues across the other provinces, uh, developed new competency profile and very clearly it identified um, through a number of um, stakeholder engagements and 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 inviting all the uh, stakeholders to the table, we, we identified that the PCP program uh, probably doesn't, isn't long enough, particularly what Alberta has currently. Um, there are some provinces that have already recognized this and have made changes, uh, particularly Ontario, Quebec have two-year PCP programs. As I mentioned in my slide, ours is six to eight months. Um, PEI is two year. Some of the schools in Manitoba have moved to two years. So um, our um, college, after this uh, uh, new competency framework was released, have been engaged in dialogue with Minister of Health, uh, with our educational stakeholders. And we're going to look at the two year uh, PCP um, training model uh, and look to implement that um, as quick as we can. I, let, let's just say um, there are some timelines that we've set for ourselves. Uh, I'm not sure I can, but there are times, sorry, let's just put it this way. There are timelines set for the new national entry to practice exam, which is uh, 2026, third quarter for the first uh, PCP exam at the new competency profile. So we've met with the deans of all the pri private uh, sorry, public secondary institutions. And uh, what met with the Minister of Health actually yesterday morning, um, we've socialized this idea with her and now we're looking for support to, um, to start making the changes and develop a curriculum template or roadmap for uh, the changes that'll need to be made to the PCP program. So that's a long way of answering your question, Duncan, but um, there is, uh, there are, there are limitations with the current education structure with a two-year ACP and a eight-month or a six-month PCP. We're looking to uh, flip that and make it a two-year PCP um, or a longer PCP. Whether it gets to two years or not will be determined, but I would like to see us get to two-year PCP and, and perhaps move some of the base foundational knowledge out of the advanced care paramedic program into the primary care paramedic program. Um, so... It's, uh, yeah, as, as, as Duncan had pointed out, the accelerated programs, it, it really does, it is a lot of information to push into a, a six month program. And, and I think it's time that we align ourselves more nationally. So it's a great question. It was a bit of a complicated answer, um, uh, but uh, I felt it, you know, it seems like there's, this is a knowledgeable group. So perhaps I uh, hope you don't mind that I went down that little rabbit hole. Leslie, um, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I just to speak um, for the college, um, as the regulator, it is our job to work in the public's best interest, public protection. Um, we do have uh, program um, review committees. So every approved program goes through a thorough review process um, to make sure that their students that they're graduating are essentially properly skilled and competent in all of the scope of practice that they're supposed to be educated in. Um, and that's pretty regular. So if any education institution is not meeting those needs, then they're reviewed and potentially their approval is revoked as well, or they're given um, requirements to meet in order to gain that approval back. So I just want to make sure that we touch on that piece too. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, that's an important, uh, and that's one of the things I pointed out in one of the earlier slides, that's one of the roles of the colleges to set educational standards and make sure that the schools are maintaining them. On our website, we actually list uh, all the programs that are approved, and some you'll see that are conditionally approved. Those are ones that we're working with to try and ensure that um, the outcomes that the students, uh, uh, the learning outcomes are met, uh, and so the students are, are in a, a position to be successful. So, um we change that uh, as programs get reviewed and it's all on our website. So, yeah. All right. Well, thank you. And yeah, I think uh, going down a little bit of a rabbit trail uh, with information is, is uh, better than, you know, just kind of glossing over it because I know I really appreciate knowing.
those ins and outs. So thank you. Um, there is uh, one question here in the Q&A. Are there plans to implement the community paramedic program into the rural areas? Uh, that's a that's a decision by AHS EMS to do that. Um, it, it wouldn't be our decision, but I can certainly speak to it. We meet with the um, community care paramedics, or it is called, uh, just to be completely clear, it's called Mobile Integrated Health. Um, and at the, uh, it's a quite a structured um, program where these uh, advanced care paramedics take additional training through Alberta Health Services EMS to become a community care paramedic. And then they get assigned calls. Um, they're almost booked like home care versus responding to emergent calls. And the idea is that they can treat people um, uh, in their home and reduce the amount of calls, uh, transfers into the emergency departments. And so this program has mostly been, uh, I would say, it's been successful in Edmonton and Calgary. Um, but it is an AHS EMS initiative. It's not an initiative by the college. So we don't have a lot of um, authority to, let's say, bring this to some of the um, smaller uh, communities. What, what this mobile integrated health group has been doing um, by uh, expanding into this sort of area is they've been setting, I call it kind of the canary in the coal mine. They, they're the ones that would go in and, and um, what they do, are doing currently and some of the processes and protocols and treatment plans that they're enacting, some of that will eventually trickle into the, um, could potentially trickle into the, the, the work that an advanced care paramedic could do in other, in other um, uh, settings. Uh, community paramedics in Peace River and Grand Prairie. Thanks, Joanne. Um, like I say, it's not our area to, we, that we have jurisdiction over. It's an AHS, but I, I need to uh, uh, brush up on on all the different settings that they're at. Um, but yeah, what they're doing in community care paramedics uh, and, and the treatment plans um, potentially could trickle into the the um, the algorithms or the treatment, pro we call them medical control protocols that advanced care paramedics do uh, across the province. So um yeah, we'll see if they if they continue to expand in some of the the smaller communities. And I think there's a lot of benefit. Um, you know, if you can keep uh, a patient and get them treatment in their home versus always going to the the uh, the hospital, which is tends to be busy and 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 can be overcrowded, it I think it's better care for the patients. So, yeah, to Sean's point, I hope it expands too. Great. All right. Well, thank you. Seeing no additional questions, I really appreciate the questions and the comments in the chat. Um, thank you so much. And thank you, Tim, for sharing this information about uh, the college and as well to Leslie for joining us and um, chiming in. Uh, knowledge like this, I feel like it really helps us better understand the healthcare landscape in rural Alberta. And then the more informed we are as citizens, um, the better equipped we are to support our communities. Mm -hmm.